So I want to talk about the haunting of Velkwood and this episode we're doing things a little differently. This is the first attempt at this. What we're going for is an almost look out for preview. So ordinarily Bob and I will read the book, we'll analyze it in depth, but now we're going into this cold. So this is a preview of The Haunting of Velkwood, and then we're hoping nearer the time of release, we will give you the in-depth discussion. So I want you to pitch The Haunting of Velkwood to us. What is it that this book is all about, and why should we be excited? Yes, yes. So The Haunting of Velkwood is about a ghost neighborhood. There are three girls. They, 20 years ago, escaped this neighborhood. And the very next morning, the entire block of houses just became like this ghost neighborhood. It's behind this impenetrable veil that is mostly impenetrable, except to the three girls who escaped. Now, they all left and they, they've sort of scattered over the years. And now Talitha Velkwood, the, the uh, the street was named after her family, is now going to go back. A group of researchers is trying to unravel the mystery of this ghost neighborhood, and she has agreed to go back in hopes of reaching her little sister who's still trapped inside. Now, I have a confession to make, even though I said we would go into this cold. I did read the blurb. And then I thought, I just want to read a few pages of this. And then <laughs> immediately I thought, oh, why, why did I decide to do this? This is so good. I'm so <laughs> intrigued already. And I mean, the, the whole concept is so exactly what I'm in for. It, it kind of reminds me of an almost Silent Hill style concept. There's something Silent Hill, there's a little bit Twin Peaks, there's even a little bit Wayward Pines going on. And that... I don't know Wayward Pines, but Twin Peaks definitely, and a couple other people have brought up Silent Hill. It wasn't like in my mind at the time, but I can definitely see that, that like connection. Yeah, and just it, this idea of almost inverting the the haunting and 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 like playing with the idea of what a ghost is mm -hmm. is yeah, it's just so fascinating, and I can't wait to properly read and to discuss this. But I mean, where? did this idea come from? What was the genesis of this? You know, in, in a way, this is like a weird kind of roundabout. So my first three books were all period pieces. Uh, the Rust Maidens is mostly in 1980. Bones Set in Feathers is in like a fairy tale kind of long ago land. And Reluctant Immortals is in 1967, California. And I was like, I can't do another period piece, even though I love kind of historical horror. But I kept pushing at this idea that I wanted to do something like that. And I got this book called Suburbia. It's a photography book that actually influenced uh, the neighborhood because it's all just pictures of these sub suburban neighborhoods. But there's a lot of like malaise. It's really they're really interesting black and white pictures. And the book influenced The Virgin Suicides and Edward Scissorhands. So those neighborhoods were like influenced by this book. And I thought, oh, it would be so much fun to like create a whole neighborhood that's sort of stuck in time. And so in a way, it was almost my way of kind of cheating and still having a modern day novel, but having it be almost a period piece at the same time, because the neighborhood is sort of the period piece. So that was kind of where it started. And from there, I love ghost stories. I've written a number of them. I will write many more, I'm sure. And I love the idea of how hauntings so often reflect, you know, our own fears and our own secrets and the traumas we can't get away from. And I thought about like, if these girls escaped this neighborhood, what are the traumas left behind? How is it maybe crystallized from those secrets, you know, that they're trying to escape? And so that was really kind of the, the pathway I took in terms of kind of creating this world. Plus, I don't feel like I've ever seen a neighborhood become a, a ghost. I've seen like ghost towns, you see houses, 
people can be haunted. But I'm like, I don't know that I've ever seen like an allotment or a suburban neighborhood. And I'm like, okay, this can be mine. This can be my thing that I did. <laughs> Yeah, and in terms of like suburbia and having a neighborhood disappear, I mean, like you say, it's, it's difficult to think of like when has that ever been done before? We mentioned Silent Hill; it touches on it, but this is like a section. This is it's not even a complete town. So I, I think. You know, you you've hit upon an original idea here. <laughs> I hope really, so. I hope that it, that's how people feel, like whenever yeah. they they read it. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it is so difficult to hit on a wholly original idea here, and and now that we're talking about kind of creepy neighborhoods, I'm I'm now thinking of some of Sarah Langan's work as well. Like she's very much like put herself into that kind of suburban horror space. Mm -hmm. I think that my editor used good neighbors as a comp title for mm -hmm. this in some of the, the early promotions, because that I think is like, you're right. She does a lot of those kind of interesting, creepy, unsettling neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then there's almost something, I guess, Ira Levine or Ira Levin. How, how's yes. that pronounced? Bob will know. Uh, the, yes, the, I, I, yeah. I agree. I've heard yeah, it pronounced either way. <laughs> ah, okay. Bob didn't know. <laughs> you, you, you failed me there. <laughs> Sorry. But you mentioned, uh, there's, so there's a research team. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and, and obviously that they, is there like any type of, of like, recorded stuff that, that, that this research team got in, you know, that piqued their interest. In other words, so like, like from, from this, this neighborhood. Yes. Yeah, so like, there's been a lot of people trying to research it over the years, but because nothing can kind of get inside, like they try to send things inside, but like if they send a drone or anything like a little Rover, it just kind of breaks down and they're not they get a few photos at the very beginning that she gets to look at. And so that mm -hmm. kind of starts everything sort of like the inciting event is this researcher coming to Talitha with these photos. And yeah, but there they go. They don't have a lot. They need to get somebody to go in there to, to find out what's happening inside. Right. Cause it, that kind of gives it kind of a, an urban weird feel to it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, usually the way that, that that goes is there's some type of, of, you know, analog tech or something like that, a recording or something like that, that kind of ties, you know, time and history together. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, you're, you're really kind of tapping into something that uh, that I that I'm super interested in, because um, most people think urban weird is like, oh, it's folklore in a city. Um, it can be. Uh, but that's that's not it. It's it's a lot more involved than that. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of people actually write in that mode is that they don't they just don't realize it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you look at, you know, the the Benson and Moorhead films and and things like that, they're they're definitely, you know, in that arc. You know, they, they did, you know, some episodes for Archive 81. So, I mean, it's and that was definitely urban weird. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to. I want to read this book. I want. I want to read it now. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. That's what a writer always wants to hear. Yeah, and some people <laughs> have described that there's a little bit with the research team is kind of being a little bit X Files, which I loved the X Files growing up. So like, you know, I'm I'm fine mm -hmm. with those comparisons. I'm a huge fan. So yeah i think archive 81 is an interesting one to kind of bring up if we're looking at kind of investigating something kind of bizarre and disquieting happening and then of course you know now i'm thinking of like it is is it, it's a little bit more of a jump but then like well there's almost something blair witch about the concept and mm. even session nine i mean <laughs> I haven't seen that in years. I haven't oh, seen that in so it, long. It totally stands up to to how you would have remembered it because we mm -hmm. recently rewatched and analyzed it. When I watched it when it came out, it was one of the most unsettling, disturbing experiences. 
when I rewatched it, it was possibly even better. And I think, you know, just like we say, you never step into the same river twice. You never watch the same film twice because, you know, with age, you've got new perspectives, Absolutely. new experiences. So please rewatch session nine. Okay. Okay. And I like that. I like what you just said about how we like come back to things and it's different. And that's something that I like to do with my husband. He and I have been together now for like almost 19 years. So there are things that we watched when we first got together. And now when we rewatch them, it's interesting to see like, sometimes you have the same opinion on something. And then sometimes it has really, it, it's evolved. Sometimes you really have a very different opinion of it. So I always do like to do that. I'm like, do I still feel the same way about this? And there's movies that I'll really like, then maybe not like, and then go through a period that I like it again. And that's always such an interesting evolution. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, you, you said yourself that there was something twin peaksy about, <clears throat> about what you're doing here. So, I mean, I wonder in terms of when you have influences, I mean, how does that factor in to the writing, to the planning, to the overall process? I mean, do, do you watch things to get in a headspace or, or to get a vibe? Do you more kind of just like they, they influence you, but from memory? I'm wondering mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. almost in, in an esoteric way, how do you set yourself up to be in the mindset to be writing the specific book? Yeah, so that's interesting. I, I sometimes do it both ways of like, there, there are things, I don't think I went back and reread Dracula or Jane Eyre for Reluctant Immortals, because it was like Dracula meets Jane Eyre in the 1960s, basically. And I don't think I actually reread either of them, because I didn't want to be so heavily influenced by, by that even though I obviously was heavily influenced, right? But I did watch some of the film adaptations of them, again, because I like the vibe of it. I sometimes think that film is really good to get that vibe. And so I feel like with Twin Peaks, the influence on this, and I would say more so than anything, probably Fire Walk With Me is probably out of the whole Twin Peaks universe would be kind of the most in influenced on Velkwood. And that was definitely, I, I can't remember if I went back and rewatched it or not, possibly, but it was definitely more the kind of vibe and some of the themes of like, you know, trauma and how that can create these weird experiences and, and this weird horror. And then also just kind of the unsettling vibes of, of so much of David Lynch's stuff. I'm a huge David Lynch fan. Oh, yeah. I mean, David Lynch is up there with one of my favorite directors. There's... Yeah, you, you mentioned the vibe. That's the thing. If you had to explain a David Lynch film to somebody who had never seen never one, seen like one. you you can't just describe the plot because it's no. so much more than that. It's the whole experience. And I yeah. mean, David, David Lynch films, they're the type of films where you absolutely you need to concentrate on just that. You need to immerse yourself in it. You kind of need all the lights off. Just focus on the screen. You you can't take any breaks. You need to be in that headspace because it it is it is a mode. It, it's, it is. I'm going to say it's almost a way of being. It sounds like yeah. I'm describing a religion here, but it but but it really it really is. There are a few directors quite like David Lynch mm -hmm. yeah it's true and I, I I like that about you know you really do have to pay attention and they are so much more than just their plots some movies and some stories are just really their plots and they're straightforward and that's fine we need we need all kinds of different stories but that is something I always like about about stories that you could describe the plot, but it doesn't come anywhere close to kind of giving you the feel of, of what it is. I also think it's interesting that you said that you really have to pay attention because I think I remember when Twin Peaks The Return came on that Machen Amick, who played Shelley in, in the series, um, actually told people, because she's also in Riverdale, she told people like, Riverdale, we live tweet it. That's great. With Twin Peaks, you need to just watch it. We're not going to live tweet this. Like, go watch the episode. We'll talk on Twitter or whatever afterwards. I think I remember her talking about that in an interview. And I thought it was interesting because some shows, there can be a really fun vibe of like, 
you know, let's live tweet this or let's talk about it while it's going on. But I do think with David Lynch's work, there is that focus. You need to kind of pay attention to those vibes and, and what's what's going on in every every single frame, really. Yeah, I'm going to start sounding almost like like an old man here, even though I'm really not. But I do think in a way that like live tweeting is kind of spoiling cinema and spoiling TV shows. I mean, because, you know, that that's not the way in which they were intended to be consumed. But as I'm saying that, I do wonder if there will be a shift and and perhaps there already is that things are deliberately being created in a way where where they can be live tweeted because that mm-hmm. is the nature of the way in which people are, are are living. But I I don't know. I feel like you're you're missing something. I always find it odd when somebody is live tweeting what what it is they're watching. And I mean the the other. The other day, I saw somebody live tweeting. Uh, they were watching the Ari Aster movie, Bew is Afraid. And I thought, if ever there is a film not to live tweet, it is that one. I don't know if either of you have seen it. Um, so, no. I, I saw not it recent, recently. I, I have opinions on it, but... Um, as neither of you have seen it, we will keep those to myself for the time being. But it 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 is very different to anything that Ariasta has done before. Mm, okay, okay. I've you know, seen some I also people. Wonder... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was I was going to say I've seen some people recently. It looked like they they typically try to live tweet stuff or talk about it on Blue Sky or whatever. And, and then like watching certain movies that they don't, it's like that they, they don't have time to do it because they're so engrossed. Like a, somebody who would typically would live tweet something decided they were going to watch talk to me. <laughs> and then, and then they, at the end, you know, three hours later, like loved it, you know? And I was like, where's the, where's the live tweets at? You, you got, you got thrown off your game. This movie done messed your up. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder now that Twitter is kind of fragmenting more. I wonder if, because Facebook and Instagram and even TikTok don't really lend themselves to that kind of live engagement quite the same way. So I wonder, like you say Blue Sky, and that's a kind of similar Twitter platform, right? I haven't really used it, Mm -hmm. but I've seen it. Yeah. But I wonder if that is something just so unique to the Twitter era. And if we're moving out of the Twitter era, will that continue or will that really just of a moment? That's mm. that's an interesting comment because I guess each social media platform has a way in which we can discuss art and we can discuss literature. And so, yeah, the live tweet, I mean, the clue is in the name, is very specific to yeah. Twitter or, of course, other platforms like, like Blue Sky. And I mm-hmm. presume... Uh, Instagram's threads that are, are a very kind of live oh, yeah. text based God about social friends. media platform. But I mean, yeah, I I started laughing when you mentioned the idea of live tweeting or doing something similar on TikTok because that would be so ridiculous. Because you'd hear the movie in the background, you're holding your phone. Yeah. And, but it, but yeah, like TikTok, it would it's a case of like, you know, I've just come out the movie. Here's a few minutes as to what I thought. Yeah. YouTube is more, here's a kind of longer, more considered analysis of the film. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I suppose Instagram, if you're going for a video, it would be similar to TikTok. If you're going for an image, it's like, here's a picture of the cover. Bloody loved it or (laughs) whatever the review happens to be. Some people use the post to write things that are longer, I guess, on Instagram, kind of the same way you could use Facebook, I guess. But yeah, I mean, sometimes somebody will do like a block on Instagram and they'll have like several things. Like if you're talking about a book, it might be like, you know, here's a few things that, you know, family, you know, or found family or something like that, like little like catchphrases, you know, that help you know what it's about. But yeah, Twitter is is such a unique kind of ecosystem that nothing has ever really kind of 
mimicked it quite in that way. I mean, I know blue sky and I, I forgot about threads. You brought up threads and I was like, what? I'm like, oh, that's right. Like that was a big thing for like a, a quick minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I've never even used threads, but I, my understanding is that it, it is essentially like Twitter, not Twitter, like blue sky, essentially a copycat of mm -hmm. Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I've said ever since the whole kind of Twitter debacle started that whatever the new of the moment social media platform is, it will be nothing like anything that we've experienced yes. before because mm -hmm. it is never a copycat that becomes yeah. the next big thing. Yeah. So it, I, I right. think whatever is going to take off, yes. It, yes. it, it, it doesn't exist yet. Or if exactly. it does, it hasn't taken off yet. So th this is why there's such a panic because there is no dominant social media platform right now. And that's no. why, as you said in, in the first hour, that people are returning to the newsletter because that <laughs> is something that they've got control over. Yes. Yes. And I, I think you're right. I think that is a lot of it. It's like, okay, this is something that like, you know, I... I know I can keep doing if I choose to, and I know kind of the rules of this. I mean, I don't necessarily because I've never had one, but the idea of it is you control it a little bit more. It's not something that, you know, somebody's going to come and take over and completely change, although I guess they could, right? Somebody could always do that anytime you're using a third party. But chances are author newsletters will be author newsletters, you know, for as long as we want to have them. And again, that's why I, I never stopped using my blog. And I'm glad now because I'm like, at least that's a place that like I can post things and I can get out there. And, you know, cause I remember at one point I, I remember thinking like, nobody's really using a blog anymore. And I kind of was like, oh, I'm like one of those people, like a relic of another time. But now that I'm not on Twitter and now that it's fragmenting so much, I'm like, I'm happy I've got my blog. I kind of just see it as being like a subset of my website. And I, you know, I think a lot of authors still have websites. So I think that that, that works but yeah it's, it's interesting and i do think your point is well taken of whatever is going to be the next thing it's probably not going to be a copycat you're right it's almost never that kind of repl generic replacement becomes the big new thing it's something that we and i i as you were talking i'm like what will it even be like you know TikTok is the videos and instagram's the pictures and facebook's mostly text like longer blocks of text a lot of times or, or article sharing or something and then tweets were like these small little kind of like compact like I always feel like people who can be really really pithy did really well on Twitter and I'm loquacious and I'm not as pithy so I never felt like I kind of got into the rhythm of Twitter because I'm like I don't know I don't feel like I can be as clever and like what 140 was it 280 characters by the end it was 280 by the end right is it still <laughs> yeah they, they they definitely increased the amount of characters by by the end of it and I I think that Blue Sky, their limit is something in between the original count on Twitter and the new one, because, I mean, I often duplicate content between the two, and I can always fit just a little bit more on a tweet than I can a Blue Sky post, mm -hmm. but, but o only a little bit more. So, <laughs> yeah might get that extra word there might be an article or, the, or an an <laughs> just to, <laughs> for people to enjoy that and and anna the usernames on blue sky they're slightly longer because they have the dot b sky social or whatever <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so that, that kind of contributes to it but yeah, yeah I, I i don't know what it will be so if people were tuning in and they were hoping i would reveal the new social media platform sorry to disappoint but i i think it will have to be something that is very quick to do you yeah. know to sustain people's interest and mm -hmm. like i said before i think that video is having a moment and i think it is taking off and so I do think for people who have the time that TikTok is like a, a growing and an expanding platform, but you you know that that caveat to having the time, that's why it's not going to be for everyone. Yeah. Also, like in in an era where anonymity has become scarce, I think we are 
we are maybe going to shift more towards that and there's more awareness and uh, of people not wanting to give so much about their private life out on the internet i mean gone are the days where you know over a decade ago after a night out you'd photo dump all your pictures on facebook um and and, yeah. and we know that you know that there is a danger in sharing so much personal information so there's a shift and i think that makes people reluctant to be on video also like that there's just so much more involved you want to make sure that you look presentable you want to look at what's out what what's going on in the background it, it's too much hassle so whatever it is it's going to be kind of quick it's going to be snappy TikTok has video covered instagram has images covered Mm -hmm. so there's probably going to be something text-based but it's not going to be like facebook it's not going to be like twitter yeah it can't just be lung form content <laughs> so yeah. i don't know i don't yeah. know what it's going to be yeah yeah it's probably going to be a mix of of all three types Maybe. of media and it, it's gonna get yeah. That's that's the way I see. Whoever's whoever's creating the next new thing, it's gonna it's gonna be you're gonna be able to do short videos. You're gonna be able to do photos in, in such a way that it's gonna be different than Instagram. And you're gonna be able to do you know somewhat uh, probably a little bit longer form text. They're not gonna just like give you like hey yeah you can just type whatever you want. You have like whole you know screeds of rants. Um, uh, I can imagine if I got pissed off about something, how long I can go on about it. But, uh, you know, so it'd be like, I need more characters. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's going to be because there's nothing else, you know, other than, you know, it's like, it's like, yeah, have you been to the new site? They actually reach out and touch you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's now that's fucking creepy. And that would make there is something I I do wonder <laughs> about that of like some kind of virtual reality thing, something like that kind of taking like this AI stuff to some other level. I don't want that to be clear. That's like a horror story to me. But I do wonder if it's going to be something like that, because I feel like in the 80s or the 90s, I feel like that was a thing that you would see that people thought was coming, that you'd be like standing in some virtual reality box or mm -hmm. something or have some kind of headgear on and it would be like a total recall kind of thing right like is that what we're heading toward like sometimes i think like the science fiction possibilities of all of this like science fiction becoming like science fact it's kind of scary sometimes yeah mm -hmm. yeah i mean i i won't be surprised if there will be some sort of like hologram-esque mm -hmm. <laughs> way of yeah. communicating okay. but you know, it's like, I, I don't need that. It's like, if you want to convey a message to me, Gwendolyn, just I can watch the video. I don't need you standing in my living room. Right? <laughs> Some That's bizarre like AI. I agree. Yeah, yeah <laughs> just, just on the video is fine. That's, that's enough. Same for you, Bob. <laughs> So you don't, you don't want me to come in your uh, living room and, and, and talk to you about that movie I just watched? <laughs> Uh, no, not, not not in terms of a virtual representation uh, of you. If you're ever over in Japan, you're most welcome to see me <laughs> in person, old school. But I I don't need a a, a robot computerized version of you. Yes, just, just exactly. like the, the the real deal, no imitations, no substitutes. I can imagine if you have like a really weak signal, you'd end up like Max Headroom or something. You know, just yeah. all glitchy. So yeah. True. So oh, true. The, yeah. The the glitches. I mean, can you imagine? It's like it's Max Booth's head, but on like I don't know Anya Albon's body. It's like this is just weird. This is glitching. This is not. Or, or like it starts malfunctioning, and I start getting angry messages that were meant to be directed to elon musk it's like it, it wasn't mm -hmm. me i didn't do anything are you, are you, are you you're, you're talking to somebody and you get and you have this you know too many fingers you yeah, know it's like, yeah. Yeah. and then the other day you know you're like what the fuck is that <laughs> <laughs> yeah so ai glitches Ugh. Ugh. yeah Ugh. 
Yeah. William Gibson is just shaking his head going, this is not what I envisioned at all. It's not. It's just really not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But maybe it was. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was, but we'll never know. But returning to Velkwood, I mean, we, we spoke before about your general writing process and how it differs from book to book. So let's get into the specifics as to how this one came about in terms of the actual writing and the structuring. Yeah, you know, it was it was an interesting process because this one, like I said, there was a there was a less of a clear outline when I started. And so like a lot of the fine tuning came more in the editing process. And that that was different. Like Reluctant Immortals had developmental edits. And actually, I think there were more developmental edits from my editor on that one than this one. So I guess I got like this closer by the time I sent it to him. So I guess it worked out. But yeah, so was working on it, it it was thinking about ghost stories, thinking about what I liked about ghost stories, thinking about what I felt was overdone in ghost stories that I didn't want to lean into, and then kind of bringing in those different inspirations, you know, like kind of a Twin Peaks vibe, a Shirley Jackson vibe. And the, obviously the Haunting of Elkwood is is a, a nod, of course, to the Haunting of Hill House. And so, yeah, just thinking about those influences, thinking about what I what I love about those and, you know, how to kind of, you know, make it my own, but still have those influences there and developing the characters and, and everything. So, yeah, you know, it, it, it was it was emotionally draining because, again, it's a story about these these survivors of this of this traumatic neighborhood that then turned into a ghost and then it's haunting them you know, both literally and, and metaphorically. And so it, it was heavy. It was heavy. And I feel like that this was probably the hardest book I've ever written. And it's interesting because like talking about it, I'm always like, I don't remember a lot of it, right? Because I feel like a lot of it was just like, at the end of the day, I'm exhausted and tired. And now I need to take a self-care day. <laughs> and I don't feel like that was necessarily true for anything else I've ever really written, that it was like that draining that at the end of like every chapter, I'd be like, okay, I, I can't, like, it was like the well was drained. Like there was nothing, there was no more creativity there for like a day or so before I could kind of go back and like, okay, let's, let's take, take on the next, the next chapter. Do you think it was possibly more draining because it was set in the modern time and the characters were closer to your own age and current experience? You know, one of the things that I I did think was interesting is I I was dealing with a lot of my own, you know, background, not obviously everything. I don't come from from a ghost neighborhood. And uh, but yeah, you mentioned ghost horses before. So that's true. I remember remember the ghost horses. That makes me so happy. (laughs) That's true. That's true. But that's like rural ghosts. Rural ghosts are different than suburban ghosts, we'll say. (laughs) But it was something that I think I did bring up to my husband at some point that I'm like, you know, it's interesting when I started really kind of unpacking some of some of my own experiences so, so much in this book that it was the first one that was modern day. And it was kind of like, you know, that that was this kind of more accessible place that when you do historical horror, it is removed. It's removed by time. Like, you know, you are in your era that people aren't going to have the same experiences that you had because of that. And I do think that there there's probably something there that it did end up making it feel more immediate in a lot of ways. And maybe I said it in that time period because I wanted to deal with those things. I'm not I'm not sure it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing. Is it, it did I want to explore something more immediate to me and that's why I said it in modern day? Did it kind of go the opposite way? I always say I still think writing is magical. Sometimes like after you're like, oh, okay, this was the issue I was working out when I was writing this. I didn't even know that until it was done. <laughs> And I mean, if you think of Velkwood specifically, is there a personal issue of yours that kind of comes to mind? Or do you think, I mean, to make it less specific, if easier, is there anything that you kind of learned either about yourself or the world through the writing? <sighs> it's a good question. It's a good question. 
I feel like, so this is relevant. So I'm bisexual and coming out was not a good experience when I was young to the point that I just stopped talking about it for a really long time. And I will give it to Twitter that I did finally start publicly talking about it there because it was such a good avenue of like, okay, if I'm going to do this publicly and just talk about being bisexual publicly, like this is a place of like a point of no return. It's not just like telling one friend, it's like telling the world. And so that was like a really, like, I will always give Twitter that credit that it was such a good avenue for that. And in writing this book, that was really something that I kind of, I started writing it not realizing I was writing about my sexuality until I was about a third of the way through and on a deadline. Because I think if I had realized I was writing about that, I would have been like, oh, I'm not going to write about this right now. And I would have started another book, but I was on deadline. And I'm like, I'm stuck writing about this now. And it was not something that I necessarily was like eager to write about. But it was necessary and I'm, I'm happier because of it. But I, I remember saying to my husband and I'm like, this book, I, I hope it's a success, but like how it's changed my personal life even before it was published was like so huge because I'm like, I have to deal with this. And also in the idea that like, it's a very queer book. There's a, there's a central relationship in the book between, between two of the female characters. And it's very central to, you know, the, the heart of the story. And there was no way I could put this out there and not be out. I felt like somebody could, by the way, anybody out there, you do not have to come out. That's a really important thing that I think needs to be said. You can write queer characters and not be out. But I was actually worried because I was still on Twitter. And sometimes people could like bully writers if they were writing queer characters, but not out. And I thought like, oh, if I, if I do that and I write this book, and then somebody bullies me for not being out when I already had trauma around not being out. I'm like, oh, I don't know how my mental health will respond to that. So I'm like, I need to just be out before this book comes out so that I can feel like, OK, this is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at a safer place in promoting this book. And so it was like this odd thing that it kind of forced my hand in coming out because I didn't want to deal with some of the repercussions, which, again, the irony is. Not long after I came out, people really started having more discourse on Twitter of don't bully people if they're not out and writing queer characters, you don't know their experience, which I think was a discourse that was really, really important to have because you don't know what's going on with somebody. Some people aren't safe in coming out and this is their only place that they can talk about it. So I was always horrified that anybody would do that to begin with. And then the grandest irony is I'm not even on Twitter anymore. So I wasn't going to be bullied on Twitter when this book came out. So it ended up being this kind of funny, like, kind of like circle this book took. But that's really the big thing for me that this book is sort of all about and dealing with in a lot of ways. So, yeah, <laughs> that was a long answer. <laughs> no, but an important one. And, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that the experience of publicly coming out and talking about it was a positive one because I mean yeah you said it was you know a good thing and it ultimately was but it, it it's also obviously not a good thing that you felt pressured that you had to do that to you know um kind of avoid potential repercussions later on because no one should ever be forced to or bullied no. or or or, yeah. or made to come out um that that's a very personal decision yes. mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. you know for for some people they they decide you know they they only want to talk about it um you know with with, with close friends and and Absolutely. with close family or or sometimes not Absolutely. with family depending on the family yes, member. Depending so, on family yes and yeah, yeah I, no one should no one should ever feel that way. And I, I actually I was glad to see before I left Twitter that there was a lot more discourse of people saying don't ever do that to people. And I was really happy to see that because it's it, that's a really horrible thing to do to people. And no matter what, like, you know, you people have to come out on their own terms. And like you said, some people just want to be out to the people in their immediate immediate circle. And that's fine. Whatever works for people. But it did ultimately, you know, it wasn't from the, it wasn't the way maybe me I wanted to, that I kind of felt that my, I, my hand was forced in it. But since then, I've been very happy about, about having done it. And it was something that was, like I said, it was like a point of no return. And then, then I felt like I had a real sense of community because a lot of other bisexual writers, you know, came out or talked to me and it was like, Hey, you know, this is the thing that, you know, 
we didn't have a great sense of community specifically about, you know, bisexuality. And then this last year at StokerCon, I did the first ever bisexuality and horror panel. And so it was really neat to kind of like literally in a year's time to go from being like, oh, I'm not out publicly to actually, you know, hosting this panel and moderating it and having like a really nice crowd and a really nice discussion. So it ended up being, it's been a positive thing. It's been a positive thing, definitely. And I'm, I'm glad that that that's been the journey for this book. But it is odd talking about this book now because it's been like almost two years since I sent it in. And now like things are so different. Like when I first wrote this, it was like, oh, I'm never going to come out publicly. I don't think that I'm mm -hmm. comfortable with that. Like I said, there was like a history of a lot of not great stuff from, from people in my life. And then to be where I'm at now, it's at a, such such a different point, just like less than two years later. So that's been that's been interesting. That's an interesting experience. Yeah. And I mean, in terms of the history and the bad experiences, when you first, you know, at, at, attempted to come out or, or that you did come out, I mean, we don't have to talk about the specifics if you don't want to. We can, if that's somewhere you're comfortable to go. But I, I wonder, in now having had this positive experience and in coming out and it, it feeling like a, a safe environment has that helped you to kind of I, I I'm reluctant to know which, which verb to even go for here like to to deal with to um have some peace or to to yeah. maybe not hold on to all of the trauma and negativity that yeah. you previously had Yes, definitely. And that that's been such an interesting thing because it's like, you know, the trauma is still there, right? Like it's still there to some extent, but it's less than, and there's something to really be said that Twitter coming out on Twitter was safer and happier considering how we've just been talking about how Twitter can be so toxic. So it's interesting to me that like this, this toxic platform had this really, really positive experience for me. And so, yeah, it definitely has helped and it's kind of taken away a lot of the the lingering fears from from childhood from growing up in this very small very backwards town in Ohio and I love Ohio by the way like I don't blame the whole state I'm I'm very proud of Ohio in general but there were a lot of you know not good experiences and not really a lot of role models in terms of you know any kind of positive outlook at at not being not being straight at being queer and being young in, in that environment. So it, it has been really nice to find community and it's been really wonderful for it to be something that is just positive that I don't, I don't really see a lot of, you know, negative input from anyone. I'm, I'm sure, you know, there's always people out there, right. That aren't very nice, but like it has been, I have been able to surround myself with a lot of really positive people and that's been a really good thing. Yeah. Yeah, that that's fantastic. And in terms of like the panel that you were on, are there any kind of overarching takeaways or messages that you might want to share from that panel for people who weren't there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the things we were talking about is there's there tends to be a lot of like bi erasure. The idea of like bisexuality, like the bisexual characters or bisexual people either being labeled as straight or gay and lesbian. And that, you know, talking about bisexuality as a kind of unique, you know, experience and a unique identity. And one of the things we also said is that almost none of us, I think, I don't think any of us had ever used the word bisexual in any of our writing and how it's almost like we can delete ourselves and erase ourselves. So it's like something I keep challenging myself. Like it's not the word bisexual is not in Velkwood even though it's clearly telegraphed that these these characters are bisexual. And so that's something I'm kind of moving forward with of like, okay, you've got, you can't complain about people erasing bisexuality if you're not kind of talking about it more overtly. And so that was really interesting to just sort of realize and have this kind of conversation with other people about like, what, what does this mean? What does it mean to us? And what does it mean kind of in the horror genre? Because there's actually a lot of bisexual representation in horror. Like we talked about like Jennifer's body is clearly a representation of bisexuality. That horror is a good place for it. And sometimes it's done for shock value. But, you know, and we were talking about basic instinct earlier, like about the kind of like sleazy kind of 90s. And she's bisexual in that. And she's like a great villain. She's fantastic. So it's like, 
you know, that this kind of idea of like, there is a lot of representation in the horror genre already of bisexuality and just kind of teasing that out and having more discourse around it. Yeah, and I certainly agree with, you know, the, the erasure. And I mean, I agree with your point. <laughs> Let's be clear on that. I don't agree with. <laughs> I mean, it, it was obvious, but just in case the, <laughs> the sound bite came out wrong. And I mean, unfortunately, too often, you know, you you see like some somebody who's bisexual, they are in a relationship with a, mm -hmm. a, an opposite gender yes. partner and then there'll be people who will try and belittle that or will be like oh well you know your bisexuality doesn't count and it's like what what, what the hell are you are you yes. talking about doesn't doesn't count that's ridiculous mm -hmm. I mean if you were to apply that to any other kind yes. of attribute then it would be ridiculous you know it's like oh if, if you're in a relationship with with somebody who has brown hair that means you're not attracted to someone with blonde hair <laughs> ever it's, yeah it's just silly it, it is, is. It it is. yeah because and i mean so that that's the whole meaning of the word it, it's i mean it's like and, and i've seen that on social media and i you know i'm i'm those are arguments i'm not going to get involved in but I see that and usually just kind of roll my eyes and move on. But my, 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 if I had a comment, I'd be like, do you not understand how one definitions work? And two, have you looked at the definition of the word that you're disparaging on social fucking media right now? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, hey, you've also you give people enough rope, they'll hang yourselves with it. So, you know, it's like someone else is going to school your ass. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. just going to scroll. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to move on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of a good point in general, Bob, in terms of when people make a... <laughs> I don't want to use the word idiotic, but it's too early for me to come up with anything else. <laughs> when people make an idiotic comment, it's like, instead of responding, if you're just silent, they'll just keep going and going and going uh -huh. until mm -hmm. they've dug such a hole or they've reached such a point of absurdity. And also, often the point of people saying such a ridiculous thing is to get attention and to get right. into a fight. Yes. So if you don't respond, then they don't get what they wanted you take anyway. You fire away from them, your yes. the ability for them to start a fire. Yeah. Which is, as I've gotten older, that in, in, a lot of times, too, I won't even scroll. I'll just close the browser. <laughs> I'm done. And it's like, yeah. it's, so it's time, it's time to listen to a podcast. Uh, it's time to write. It's time to just to close the whole browser, hit that X at the top and you're done, you know, and just yep. move on. Um, is, but I, I don't, I don't see a lot of times I just don't see myself in, in, in a position to argue over something, especially if I'm not one, I'm not, I'm not a, of that community. So I, I really have no voice to speak there. You know, um, it's kind of like, um, you know, like if I if, if I if I wrote a queer character, I would not write from the queer POV. Mm. Yeah, but I would yeah. be you know uh, write it with respect and reverence that it deserves. Mm -hmm. But I would not write it as you know I guess the the POV of the queer experience because that's mm -hmm. that's not what I am. Uh, same thing with some writing a character of a different race or different nationality or or different gender. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying I can't do it, do it and I'm not saying I haven't done it. And but I think that the times I have, I've, I've done it respectfully. It's like what Colson Whitehead says: you can write about anything you want to write about, just don't fuck it up. You know, yeah. so that's yeah. you know, and that, and that to me, I, I take that to heart. You know, I don't, I don't have the ability to speak on something that I'm not familiar with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we're previewing The Haunting of Velkwood. So, who is this book for? Who are the types of people or readers who should absolutely pick it up? I would definitely say fans of ghost stories, for sure. Fans of queer horror. I think that there's some feminist horror in there, so fans of feminist horror. 
You know, fans of like weird horror, like horror, you know, uncanny things, you know, I hope David Lynch fans would like this. I did see at least one person talk that it's got a Lynchian vibe, which I was excited that somebody, you know, not me picked that up. So that made me happy. So definitely kind of weird horror, ghost stories, you know, stories about, you know, kind of reckoning with the past, queer horror, feminist horror. I feel like those are like the really big ones. And so on that note, and I'm totally going to put you on the spot here, but let's say in the last five years, what have been the most impactful ghost stories, queer mm-hmm. stories, and Lynchian S stories for you? <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh, yeah, you are putting me on the spot. Like, I feel like AC Wise does some really, I mean, she does some fantastic uh, queer horror as well. And she also does such fantastic ghost stories. I feel like out of everybody who's writing ghost stories right now, you know, she's just incredible. So definitely, definitely her. And, you know, J.A.W. McCarthy has done some great queer horror. I really like her short fiction. She's just a fantastic writer, and I just love everything she's she's been writing lately. So that's definitely, definitely her. And oh, what was the other one? Lynchian. Oh, wow. Yes. Lynchian. Lynchian work. That's really specific. I'm trying to think. What has, like, struck me as had David Lynch vibes? I don't know, but I wish I had an answer and I'm going to think on this because like I, there's gotta be something out there that I feel like has had like kind of Lynchian horror vibes the last few years. Cause that, that would be really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I guess like, like, as we say, Lynchian is almost impossible to define. You just yeah. feel yeah. it, but in terms of literature that has something a little bit Lynchian about it, the first person who comes to mind is Eric LaRocca. Mm. And yeah. I think there was something Lynchian or Lynchian adjacent about his, I think it's his latest, but he puts out so many books it might not be anymore, but Everything the Darkness Eats, which was published by clash books that there's something of a lynchian flavoring i don't know if bob would agree there as both someone who's read the book and a connoisseur of david lynch Mm -hmm. i i i I feel that vibe I, i would say it's there um but I mean, I think Eric is also like he like I always. I, I joke that I'm like a disciple of, of, of the the school of Cronenberg, Fincher, and Lynch, mm-hmm. uh, the mm-hmm. three Davids, and I think that that Eric, you know, he he gets in there too, um, because at those three Davids they kind of cover like a spectrum of 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 the dark, you know, um, where you have you know you have. It, existential you have visceral and you have uh, a psychological component and all three of them do each one at their at their at their leisure and so to me it's like you know those that that that's the vibe and uh and eric eric captures it so i mean if if, if, if but if they're if they're saying that velkwood is going to be you know lynchian and not and you know i'm definitely interested um, the whole thing that you mentioned about the, like the, uh, like a veil that's covering this neighborhood and you have a research team. It, it, it's, I, when you said that, I, I, I couldn't put my finger on it. It's like that, man, but that, that's an annihilation. Jeff Vandermeer. Yeah. You know, I haven't read it or seen it's it. Probably but people not have said that. that but yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's people other people have that have said that. that? Yeah. People have made that connection. Like I said, I haven't, I, I, I shouldn't even admit that. At this point in time, I feel like I probably should have read or seen it. But yeah, I like I I haven't. And so that has come up. Like from what I understand of it, there's definitely what's inside is very different. But the idea of there being this kind of like separate also WandaVision. WandaVision came up, which I haven't seen that, but I was aware that there might be like a um comparison there of like the idea of how there's like kind of like a separation in that. So mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I like that concept, and I know I know what's inside of your veil is going to be different than what's inside the shimmer. Yeah, um, yeah. 
Uh, there's no doubt. Um, but it, it's, I don't know. It, it's when you get into that, there were some very creepy things that happened in the shimmer as well, that not necessarily the visceral stuff and the, the trans, the transformational stuff, but there were some, also some creepy uh, kind of lean into the ghostly. And it's just mm-hmm. like, man, you know, uh, Oh man, I'm, 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 I can't, I can't wait to read this book. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm excited. I'm freaking excited. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Me too, Bob. Like, I, like, I'm, I'm not just saying it, but when I started to read the first few pages, I did think, why have I decided to experiment with this preview? like format with this new idea when this is so good and I just want to spend my entire night reading it but Mm -hmm. you know we we said we were going to do this and also you know Bob would be like what the hell you told me we were going into this cold and you read the damn thing last night one one (laughs) you, you you cheated two you got it and I don't so hey something (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i need to send you a copy of it then oh. <laughs> he wanted to keep it all to himself see i see <laughs> what he's doing there i see what it, that way he can go check what i discovered <laughs> well i mean normally you're the person to discover good books mm. months before me bob so <laughs> I, I had to do an intervention <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when, when we're talking about the the veil as well, that then makes me think of Stephen King's Under the Dome. Mm-hmm. Ah. Ah. And another yeah. kind of suburban, like small town horror. Like I'm I'm sensing a small town horror vibe from this too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I love small town horror. Like I, I came from small town horror. I feel like a lot of us came from small town horror. So <laughs> And then that definitely covers the Wayward Pines. Uh, I don't know that, well. though. It's a, it's a TV show, right? It, it's also a series by the author Blake Crouch. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. I need to look this up. Like, I feel like there's only so Watch much time Watch a couple in episodes. I, I don't know where it's at, though, anymore. Uh, I thought it, it may still be. Uh, originally, I think I watched it on Hulu. Uh, oh, it okay. may still be there, but I got. And it was very interesting. Um, I just got had other stuff that I wanted to watch. And so I probably should go back and, and look where I can find it. Yeah, um, it's really but good. It, what I watched was like, wow, uh, this is actually pretty good. So now, now yeah. I've got a, a mission. I'm going to find it. Ooh, bless you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you, you said as well that this was a more – draining book to write than anything else that you've read and we we spoke a little bit about as to why that may be but I wonder did you put anything in place to be protective of your energy and your mental health just to try and mitigate I guess the, (laughs) the energy sucking nature of it and to make sure that you were well No, not really. Not really. Like I said, the most I really did was in between like chapters. I was like, I am very exhausted for a day and like giving my time myself that time to at least be like, I'm at least taking a day off to like, you know, try to recover. But yeah, like I I keep saying, I hope I don't ever have a book that draining again. I hope I can do something, you know, very deeply affecting and moving and emotional without it being that draining. But we'll see. Fingers crossed, right? But yeah, I do think there needs to be more self-care built in the next time of like at least some meditation, some deep breathing, something. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, not only can you go to David Lynch for great films, but you can go to the David Lynch Foundation for some meditation and breathing. So he's got you covered in all aspects of life. It's so true. I love that one book he did that it was like, was it catching the big fish catching there's something about catching yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. it's a a fantastic book Mm -hmm. and you know a lot of on writing and on creativity books they'll they'll kind of give you like takeaways or 
exercises, but I felt with that it was it was more just inspiring and musings yeah. upon creativity. There was no kind of easy do this. Would, would, yes. would you know? I mean, it would be. It is kind of ridiculous anyway because each creative's journey is their journey. It is yeah. individual. I think it may have been, you know, with you when we talk about the caveat of your mileage may vary when it comes to writing advice. And so, yeah, that is just a a book of inspiration. It is a very slender read as well. It is. It is. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, when I first read it, I just like start the day with a few pages from it because he each chapter or each section I mean it can be consumed within a few minutes so just uh-huh. you know start the day with David Lynch and <laughs> you know <laughs> it will set you right and if you if you need even more Lynch as, as well as the films and the meditation and the creativity doesn't he sometimes give like weather updates can't yes. you get that as well yeah. you can watch a video of him telling yes. you what the weather is <laughs> he does uh, the Fridays too it's it's another Friday yeah it's hilarious <laughs> that's great that's so good. yeah yeah <laughs> well you said it was around two years ago that you wrote Velkwood. So, yeah. I mean, I'm curious as to not only what is next, but I suppose what was next, as I suppose with it having been two years, you weren't like, right, well, we'll wait for this interview before we write <laughs> again. Because I'm so curious as to whether you continue to write about something in the more modern setting or if you've mm-hmm. you've gone back to the, the classic Gwendolyn period piece. So what <laughs> what's happening? Oh, I actually love this because right now I'm working on a novella and a novel and the novella is a period piece and the novel isn't. And so that's like great to me that you asked that question because that's like, so since, you know, I turned in Velk, what I think I was writing it about two years ago. I turned it in, I think, in July of what would it have been, 2022. And since then, like I after that, like I needed to take a break from novels like that book took it out of me. I'm like, I just went to short fiction and only really wrote short fiction for over a year, like short fiction and short nonfiction. I do some nonfiction writing as well, like about the genre and things. And so like, it was only kind of after last summer that I got back to like writing long fiction. And so now I'm making my way through a novella and a novel. And so like, it's not taking it out of me quite as much and like trying to do more like, okay, like leave it there if it's getting to be too much. But yeah, so that is interesting. One is set in the 1950s and the other one is set in modern day. So yeah. So despite it draining you, you've come back for more in terms of the modern day. So I I, I I love your answer too, because I mean, if there are certain people who they gravitate more towards your period pieces, then you've got them covered. If there are people who actually like, they like the, the kind of modern day stuff, you, you've got that as well. And yeah. If you like both, then happy days. Christmas has come <laughs> early. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us for this and for us previewing Velkwood. We absolutely do need to talk again in a couple of months to to get the kind of deep analysis I want listeners and viewers of the podcast as well to let us know what they think to this format. Has this got you excited for The Haunting of Velkwood? Do you want to see more of these or would you rather we just go for the in-depth analysis? So write to us and let us know. But for you, Gwendolyn, where can our listeners connect with you? (laughs) <laughs> so on my website, so GwendolynKeist.com and on Instagram and Facebook. So just at my name, at Gwendolyn Keist. Okay. Do you have any final thoughts, any final requests, any final musings to leave our listeners and viewers with? <laughs> 
just keep loving horror, which you all do. So I know everybody is going to be able to do that because it's a great genre. And I'm so happy that like, it's really having a good moment right now. So yay, long live horror. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.